So and uh, guys, if you have any questions, if you want to interact with the speaker or with anyone, you can just uh, either uh, uh, either uh, either uh, unmute yourself or you can write in the chat. So uh, the speakers or other other um, attendees can participate in the discussions. And also please uh, adhere to the topic of presentations, topic of discussions, so that it will help us to make best out of uh, the the uh, session starts. So with this, uh, let me uh, move on to my quick slides around the community about how we uh, are doing with the with Nepal Cloud Professionals and all. So basically Nepal Cloud Professionals is um, is a community of professionals from uh, uh, from Nepal, mainly from Nepal and but it, it is not limited to Nepal because we are uh, we are all across the social media, including we have a uh, uh, 2000 plus members uh, uh, in Facebook um, um, and uh, we have uh, presence in LinkedIn. We have presence in YouTube, Meetup, Insta and, and all. So um, uh, this group is basically about a Microsoft Cloud Platform, not just limited to Microsoft Azure, but also uh, is around the .NET and uh, uh, DevOps, Azure DevOps and then um, Microsoft 365 and Dynamics 365 and Power Platform. So uh, yeah, and uh, uh, just to uh, make sure that uh, we are we are uh, you know uh, when we are into the the meetup discussions, uh, please be friendly and patient. Please be welcoming and respectful. Please understand that there are differences between the people uh, coming in from a different uh, you know background and all. So uh, please uh, uh, respect each other and let's let's collaborate. Let's uh, you know have uh, vibrant discussions. So a quick intro about myself. I'm Pradeep Karel and uh, I work for Dogma Group. I am a Microsoft MVP uh, and I'm also a Microsoft certified trainer and uh, a lot into the tech community over the last uh, about ten plus years. So uh, I'm not going much much into my details, but just wanted to give you, you know, wanted to to welcome you into Microsoft Tech community on behalf of Nepal Cloud Professionals. So uh, like I said, Nepal Cloud Professionals is part of one of the Microsoft Azure Tech community, or the official Microsoft Azure Tech communities, um, and uh, um, the objective is to, you know, provide uh, mentorships, to provide uh, workshops. Uh, you know, have uh, presentations, webinars, provide an opportunity to 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 partner, to to network with the people in the community, and so on. So I'm highlighting that the mentorships part here because uh, many a times uh, there are people who look for mentorships, and uh, there are many a times that uh, that who is willing to provide mentorships in the community. So many a times we would like to do the matchmaking as well. So uh, this could be of your interest. If this is of your interest. Please to uh, reach out. Uh, I think I, I sort of uh, talked to you about the community guidelines. Uh, this is also mentioned in our website, nepalcloudpro.org, um, and other social links as well. Uh, yeah, with this, I just wanted to give you an idea that over the last couple of years, we have been running a lot of uh, Microsoft 365 uh, developer bootcamps, or be it be um, the Azure bootcamp, hackathons, you know, and then. Um, so we partner. We have partnered with the Asia Pacific Data Platform Community, and come up with the uh, with the various uh, um, sessions uh, around data platform. We have also uh, run a global AI bootcamp in the past, and we hope to do it uh, in the coming days as well. Uh, so yes, and just wanted to uh, you know highlight this that if you are willing to speak in the upcoming meetups, please do uh, send your interest. Uh, there's a link that I can I can provide, uh, but uh, but just reach me and uh, or <clears throat> I mean it's quite easy, so I'll I'll be able to share the speaker form. So uh, once you fill in, uh, we will have you in the in the list of the uh, potential speakers for the upcoming meetups. So with this, I want to uh, you know kick start this this today's meetup uh, where we have really good speakers lined up. Uh, Sandesh Karki. Sandesh Karki is the software engineer, and uh, he's based in Nepal, but but now in Australia. So uh, so I think Sandesh is 
already in the call. Uh, but uh, let me move on to the next speaker. We have Saad Mohammed, senior data scientist at Microsoft. Um, so I really don't want to introduce myself because I want to give this a space to to the speakers themselves. And um, yeah, and uh, then we have Abhishek Sukla, senior technical architect at SCL Technologies. So last but not the least, we have Yubaraz Dahal, senior engineer at Altizen. So I, I'm sure that we are going to have a great session today. So please enjoy these sessions and try to participate in the discussions. Try to ask questions to the speakers. Um, let's not rush, but let's be on time. Um, so yeah, if you have any further questions or anything, please do, do feel free to reach out to me. So with this, uh, if you want to reach me out, you can also reach me at pradeep.kernel at nepalsoftware.org. Um, yeah, with this, uh, I would like to to uh, move on to the, our speaker. Our uh, first speaker. Let me check into the chat. Um, Sandesh, if you are there. Are you uh, yeah, I'm here. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so uh, can you guys hear me? OK, great. Yeah, over to you. Yep. Uh, good. Uh, let me share the screen first. Mm -hmm. Just give me a sec. Um, so it really looks the window. Um, which screen is this? Um, Yes. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Hello. Not not so far. Um, so oh, yes, yes, something. I think. I, yes, yeah, I guess. Uh, <laughs> um, so let's start. So so the topic of today's presentation is Azure DevOps for mobile application. Um, so I'm Sandesh Karki, I'm software engineer at Intersub, and I'm like, I do a lot like .NET uh, development, Azure development, and recently I've started doing some uh, DevOps. And so in a community, like once I have learned something for DevOps, I wanted to share that same thing I did a lot. So let's move on to today's agenda. So what we'll be today, do today in our session will be, uh, we'll create a Android pipeline for, uh, with Using Azure DevOps, we'll create a pipeline for iOS as well if we have enough time. But our focus would be Android pipeline. And after that, I will show you some steps about Azure pipelines and how we work with uh, App Center, uh, Microsoft App Center. So uh, let's talk. Why do we need uh, DevOps for mobile? So the main point is rapid rapid development. So suppose we have a client and Client, our clients want a mobile application, and we are using suppose Xamarin for uh, cross-platform development. We, so we are we have uh, iOS uh, app as well as Android app. So what DevOps gives us is rapid development. So uh, maybe you add a new feature, a small feature, a small bug fix in a day or in a week, you know, like in a fortnight, and you want to deploy that to the give that to the client rapidly. You need uh, you can use Azure DevOps, and it, it decreases the time significantly. And while I was starting with Xamarin, one of the problem with uh, Xamarin was you need a Mac if you want to build for iOS. And if you are, are using iOS, and once in a while the Xamarin gets an update, and you have to update update that Xamarin and both Mac as well as the PC Studio that you are using in, using in your Windows machine, and that is really hectic. And sometimes just updating uh, uh, Xamarin in Mac takes a day, and it is agile, so yeah. Uh, Agile means like it is fast, the same as the first one. So you get the tickets from your clients. You do, you automate uh, everything. You automate the build. You automate the release. Uh, that is with uh, that is that is something uh, the what do you call DevOps give us automated testing. Testing is one of the main feature of application. So in a small application, testing might not be that important. But if you are making a big application and the big application might need a change like after a year. So if you have automated testing, the code that you have written like a year ago can be bad, uh, verified after a year. So when you add a new feature, so you will know that the code is still working. Uh, productivity and efficiency. So 
as I told uh, in like the second point, updating our uh, Xamarin in like iOS takes a lot of time. Updating it is in, it in uh, like Windows machine also takes a time. Building it takes time. Releasing it takes time. So if we use DevOps, it becomes a like slick pipeline. So the, those time needed for development, sorry, releases and like building can be significantly decreased with as a DevOps. So what we will be using for uh, today's present, uh, today's like presentation, we will be using Xamarin pumps for creating a mobile app. We'll be using Azure develop, uh, DevOps for uh, running a pipeline, and we'll use App Center for our like just managing the our distribution or the release packages of the application. So let's move on to demo. Um. So let me. Get my Visual Studio. So I created a simple application this morning. So let's just run this application. It takes a bit of time to run application. So this is just a uh, like very simple application. This application, but this application but it divide a number. So if I have like a number four, four divided by two would be two. This is just a simple application. Um, so the application is not the point of this presentation. So uh, what I wanted to show you was I have like this application. These three are the same application. This is like the main uh, package that everything is in here. These are the packages with uh, like our assets and stuff for both iOS, iOS and Android. And the another project will be test. And as I told you, I have just written a simple test. What would be one is responsible for getting an exception whenever I divide a number by zero. And another will be just a correct case. And if I run this test, it should give me. Um, should pass so all three tests are passing um so uh it will take a time around six seconds maybe so yep uh all six uh, three tests are passing um and i have to like deploy this to the devops so let's go let's go to devops so the URL for DevOps should be dev.azure.com slash my username. If I go here, I have created an application and I have pushed the same code in the repository. So what we have is like uh, two folders. One would be SRC and the SRC have um, the three like, main application project and this folder which has one test that we have available. So to create a pipeline, we need to go to the uh, pipelines at the left side of the bar. If you go there, I have created, already created one pipeline for testing, but if you want to create a new pipeline, you have to go to the new pipeline. Just create, click the new pipeline, select the repository. So uh, uh, my repository is uh, Azure Git. You can use like uh, GitHub, uh, Bit, uh, Bitbucket, and other any other uh, Git management system. So I go to the uh, as a repo, select the repository and select, uh, first of all, I'm creating the Android. So you have like the predefined YAML files for all the, uh, what you call pipelines. So I select the Xamarin.Android, right? So it gives me something. So let's look at the things. Uh, first of all, there is a trigger. So trigger means it is CI CD. So it should be continuous. So whenever you push something in the master branch, so it is a trigger this pipeline starts to run. And you can also have like um, pull request. You can have like every time you uh, do a pull request into a certain branch, the pipeline runs again. So uh, what actually pipeline does is rather than building it, uh, building everything in your machine, it builds in the some agent hosted somewhere in Azure. That is the difference. And rather than using a Visual Studio for building, it uses the command line to build, build in another agent. So let's take the stuff. So uh, what is the machine that this pipeline will run on? It will run on the Mac OS machine with the latest version. Uh, it has some variables. So the variables are conf build configuration or release. So it will build using the release configuration right here. 
it uh, it will uh, the output of the build will be in this folder. So build that binary directory and build configuration. These two are the variables that are stored in the pipelines, and these are system variables. So after that, it does another. So after that, now we have set up the agent. We have our agent macOS. So building something has a couple of steps. So the steps are first of all, there is a step called NuGet tool installer. So Visual Studio, Visual Studio, and all its project needs a NuGet packages. So this, those can be those packages can be created by you, or those packages can be like from community, or those packages can be from anywhere. So to install a NuGet package using command line. You need to have these two steps. So it just in, installs the NuGet package manager, not sorry, NuGet installer in your host machine. So now macOS has NuGet installer. So after that, it will install the NuGet, NuGet command. It will restore the NuGet in the solution file. And we have one solution file in our project. So it, it will restore all the like NuGet packages and in the solution. And after that, the last step will be it will build the Xamarin.android project, Xamarin project. So the project file will. Uh, our project has divider app dot Android. So at the end there is a drive. So it will find this project and it will build this CS pro project. But if I just use this thing, so the point of this presentation would be none. So let me show you something. So this will just create a uh, like this. This will just build a Xamarin Android project. But what we want is the pro project to be built and signed by our key stores. So that it can be like directly given to the Google Play stores and uploaded there. Maybe for like testing, maybe for release. So I have something here. Let me copy this one. Yep. So I have changed a lot of things here. So the trigger is still the master, the pool is still the macOS latest. Uh, now I have like uh, variable groups and like a lot more steps. So what do what else do we need to uh, like sign an application? So if I go to the library the left side of the bar, you can create a variable group. So a variable group is like a group of variables that you need in a pipeline. And you can just create variable groups and you can have some name and you can have like uh, groups of variables. So variable can be like clear file. You can give the name of the file here and you can like have a password. Password and you can write some Hi, password here. Hi, Sandis. Sandis, can you hear me? Yep. Looks like looks like your sound is a bit breaking. Uh, can we do something around it if possible? No. Uh, but uh, else uh, a bit slow would be good. Ah, all good. <laughs> yeah, a bit slower pace would be good, maybe. Yeah. Just a minute. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so you can also have mm, password uh, and stuff like that. And passwords need to be secure. So sometimes you give uh, like you can have a client access to your Azure DevOps, and they can come here and look at the password, and which you probably do not want. And you can lock this password. After you lock this password, you can lock this password and save it. You can't see. Somehow, if you don't save it, you can see that. So I have already created a variable group for my Android pipelines, uh, Android pipeline, and all the things that I will need on Android uh, pipeline is are here. So there are one, two, three, four, five things. So one is app center slugs, which I will tell how you get it and what are these. And then, then there is a key alias. So it is the name of the key store that you will use to sign your APK. So before releasing an app, you need to sign your APK. And that is the name of the key store. You have the key, uh, key password, so key store can have multiple keys, and but we are using one key store per uh, with one key, so the password of the key and the key store will be same. And I will show you how to get these key stores as well. And there is a key store file, and the file name of the file is sundeskeystore.keystore. And where is this file? So if you go back to library, there is another tab after the variable groups, and that is secure files. So this is the place you would store your secure files. Uh, if you are making like Android pipeline, you can have like, uh, you will have key store. And if you are uh, building a pipeline for iOS, you will have distribution, profi uh, distribution provisioning profile as well as 
Nah, another file, I forgot about the name, I'll show you that. <laughs> so you will have another two files over here. And the files that you have placed here would be secure. You can't download it once you have placed, uh, once it is placed here. And if you go to the top, there is a pipeline permission. So I have one pipeline. So you can have like this pipeline can ha have access to the this file. So if you are building for Android, you don't want to have that pipeline access to the provisioning profile of iOS because that, that it doesn't need it. So I have already added it. So I can remove it and you can, I can still add the pipelines, uh, what you call pipelines permission. And the same can be done for the secure variable groups as well. So variable groups has, a, has the same thing over here. So let's see how we create the, uh, what do you call the key store for our application using Visual Studio. So the, what do you call, the step for like building a APK file without, uh, what do you call, uh, without a DevOps pipeline will be going to application, right-clicking it, going to archive, and it will start to build our application in release mode. After it is done, it will have something like this, and you have to go to distribute, and you have to, you can sign in with, like sign the uh, APK file or the build with Google Play or the ad hoc. So we are using ad hoc, and you can create a new one from here. So you can, alias, this is the same thing that we had in our variable group, and you give password. It, the same password can be used for both key and the, what you call, no, key store. And after you do that, and it will create something like this, there will be a record here. And if you double click this, um, it will give the URL of the key store file. And so just copy that key store file and upload it. Um, yeah. So upload it in the secure file, add secure file and just upload it and it will be here. So now we know about, uh, I think this one, this one, this one, and this one. Now App Center slug. So let's talk about App Center. So App Center is uh, like a place, integrated place for building your application, like releasing, managing the releases of your application, uh, having the crash analytics of your application or other analytics. All those things are in the App Center. And it is uh, provided free by Microsoft. Uh, I don't think there is, except for the testing you have to pay if you want to use testing picture of the app center so the app center url will be app center ms if you go here you can create your application so uh, for now let's create the application for android and you can go here add new application so the application will be provider app and uh, i really need to select the release type it would be android and which platform was it built it was with the building Build using Xamarin. So select the Xamarin and create a new app. So after you are doing that, it will give you some like cores. You don't really need to use these cores. So these cores are used for analytics and crashes. It will give you your logs and analytics here. Yeah. And it is one of the part of the tables, but not something that we are focusing on. What these things like press and analytics and uh, uh, like debugging stuff gives you is like suppose you have an app that is already running in the production. So people are using your application. So what you want to do be, what you want to do is add these codes in your application. If you have these codes, so once in a while there is some problem in your user's phone, it crashes. Maybe they don't know it because sometimes you like application slows down and you close their application. That is something that happens to them as well. So they close the application, rerun it, and it might probably work. But what you want to be able to do is be ahead of your users so they crash their application you go to diagnostics and there is a error message like your app crashed and you need to solve that before they know it that is something devops gives us be fast be productive but what we are you going to do for today is we are using the this one on the distributor so we are going to like manage it like get the apk from our pipelines in uh, azure devops and just push it to like our uh, what you call the uh, production or test flight if you are in iOS. And you can also do the same thing that we are doing in what you call this pipeline from here. You can just select the DevOps, uh, uh, like you know, select the Git repository and you can build the application directly in App Center. But uh, I prefer using what you call a DevOps because the ability to like customize your build is more in DevOps rather than in uh, App Center. 
So let's go back. And I was creating pipeline somewhere around here. Yep, I was getting the pipeline around here. Um, uh, let just let me just edit the one that I created. So let's check the code. So we have the uh, uh, agent is macOS latest, and we have created a variable group called divider that and divider underscore Android. So it has all these key store, and its name is divider underscore Android. So it, it, the pipeline will get all these keys from variable keys from that uh, uh, library. Uh, build config is still release, output directory is still the same, and the release note is like new release A, or you can just you can have the pile uh, from which the, you can like have your release note. So maybe you have like a uh, release note, the TXT file in your core, and you can use that same thing as well. But for now, just new release A. This thing is like NuGet tool installer is still the same, NuGet command is still the same, restores the solution file. After that, there was no test in the last. What the last build. So I have added a step to add a new test step. So what it does is it, it tests the application using the test folders and the CS pro. So every person uh, in your test folder gets tested. And after that, it uh, uh, Jamlin.android is still the same. It builds the Droid project. And after now, you have built your application. So you need to sign your APK. So there is another step, Android signing at three. You sign your APK file, your APK file, the uh, uh, asterisk uh, that APK, so whatever APK file you get from your this last step gets signed with the key store, with the password and alias. And what it will give you is, it will send the output to the output directory slash app to release that APK. So it renames a, uh, what you call project uh, APK to app to release the APK. So I think the APK name of this name should be divider app uh, dot APK when it was built with this step. And why you are use why we are using this asterisk asterisk is because it will work on any pipeline. I can just copy this file and put it in another project and it's, it will still work. But if I but if I write the right direct name, it probably won't work. So after I have done this step. Uh, I will just publish my build artifact uh, with the app release or APK and it will just like uh, publish the artifact. Uh, I will show you what publish the artifact means. Uh, if I publish the artifact, I would be able to get it after the build is complete. So if you want to have any other step, like maybe some other uh, testing, some other steps, you can just go here and there is a switch assistant button and you can have other steps, I don't know, some like uh, archive the files, extract the files, zip the files. You can do all those steps from here. And if you don't like using CLI, there is still an option to click on the setting button and it will give you all the options that is available in a UI mode. So it is a lot easier. So all these things create the pipeline and the last step would be creating, putting that like now we have built our application, we have signed our, signed our APK. Now let's send it to App Center. So this would be the uh, code to send to App Center, which I have commented for now. Uh, if I run this pipeline, which I did like two hours ago, you would get something like this. So all of these steps are run. So let's see uh, what it did and uh, let's check it. So, so the NuGet tool installer just install the NuGets, NuGet commands restore the solution files. You get all the logs that you need uh, from that. And after that, there is a, the one thing that we need to look at is test. So, like we had like two tests, uh, no, two tests with this total to around three. So, passed and passed is three tests. All of the three tests are passed. And if any of the step fails, all the other steps uh, would not run. That is something. So if your test was uh, failing, the application would not build, uh, be built and it will say, failed your pipeline. So after that, it builds the Xamarin, uh, it signs the application and it publishes the artifact and how we can get the artifact. It, if I go to this, this is the pipeline. There is one artifact and if I click this, I get app to release that APK and you can just download this APK file and just run it in your mobile phone and it will work. 
but we need to like manage that to send it in our app uh, what do you call uh, app center so let's go to the app center this is my android application and i go to settings and i need to have token uh, this one so i need this token so why do we need token is we need to give access to our app uh, Azure DevOps to send the APK file to our app center. So I just create a new pipeline token. It should be give a name. I, I pipeline and you need the full access token because it needs to push the APK. It only to just download the APK and stuff. So I need full access. It's a new API token. Copy this one, and I can go to this one. So uh, I need to have like a link to the. App Center. So to do that, I need to go to Project Settings, and there is a service connections, and add a new service connection. So search to the uh, like the bottom, and there is a Visual Studio App Center. And in my experience, uh, Visual Studio App Center connection is the easiest of all. Like connecting to Azure needs accounts and stuff, but connecting to what you call App Center is really the user state token. So you go here, paste the token, and give like a divider, divider Android. So copy this one because I will need it later. Divider Android, really access to all the pipelines, set. and no thanks. After I'm done with this, I go back to divider app, and I go back to pipeline, I go to this one, I go it. Uh, let's uncomment this one. So let's see all this stuff. So survey so endpoint would be the. Um, let's go here. It should be better. So if you have got UI, uh, like divider enter, this is the one we just created. Select that one. Uh, App center log would be uh, coming from the library. Uh, binary path would be this is the output directory. This is the same thing from here. This is our output APK release uh, number, build parts would be the build number from here. And uh, yeah, I think this is it. I really know to be the variable that we created at the top. Uh, after that, uh, let's, let's, I'm missing something. Yep, I'm missing something. So if I go to library, there was a thing called app center slug in our divider underscore Android. So what is this? This is just a URL to the app center. So I have some this carcass slash divider app. But this is not correct, I think. Uh, if I go to divider app. So at the top, there is URL. So just copy the thing after users. So if I copy, it should be some this carcass slash app slash divider this one. I copy this. I copy this and I paste this and sorry. I paste it here and just remove the apps in the middle. So it should be some discard is class D by F slash one. And if you are using like now because sorry, uh, organization level, you are this should be something like uh, uh, sorry to interrupt. Sorry to interrupt uh, Pradeep sir, but sound is lagging a lot. So can we look after this, sir? We are not getting it. Yeah, there's, there's a sound uh, issue, but uh, we can't really help, right? Uh, so on this, is it possible to check what the actual issue is? I have no idea. <laughs> Probably uh, can I read uh, is it is, uh, is it is it is it good on my side? Am I? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. You are very good. Uh, your sound is very good, Pradeep sir. Uh, the okay. only uh, presenting, sir, uh, I'm not getting. Clear voice from okay. there. If, if it is, uh, uh, if, if we could uh, do anything about that, then it would be much better. Uh, that's uh, the let me rejoin with the app because I'm using the like web version. So I'll just okay. leave that one. Man. Don't right don't worry, resource. Sanjay. You just you only have like about three minutes left. Stream. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm also almost done. Yeah. Um. Uh, let's see in this then. So this is just a URL, and after I have done this, save the what you call variable groups with the new variables, 
And after I have uncon uncommented this, I will just save and run. Um, I need to reauthorize the resources. Uh, sorry, uh, variable group was not found. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. I messed something up. No, no, this is the one. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I just uncomment this one. Can you save one, save. Save and run. Uh, so it would take a bit of time. Yep. And at that time, let me show you. I don't think I have enough time to show you how the iOS one will work. So I have one of my projects I'll show you in this one. So the iOS one is the similar step. You have a trigger, you have a pool. The pool would be macOS for obvious reasons, and you have like variable groups, so high ML, iOS, uh, you don't need scheme, uh, the SDK I'm using is iPhone OS, and there is a configuration of release. And one of the steps that we need is, we need a script to like uh, install the SDK button, or select the SDK button, this is the SDK button of iOS that we need for developing our application. So this is the script that select the uh, SDK version. After that, uh, a process for iOS is a bit weird. So in iOS, Android, you build the application and then you sign it. But in iOS, you install the certificates in your machine after you, and you build it using uh, and you build it. So we need to install the certificate and you need to install the provisioning profile. These are the two steps. After that, the same step uh, as in uh, Android, you NuGet uh, tool install. You need NuGet tool installer. You uh, restore the NuGets. After that, you build iOS and these are the things that you get the certificate identity and provisioning profile ID from these tasks and that are stored in a variable and you can access them using these variables. And it will just be built using the release configuration and it will create an IPA file. So for iOS, there is an IPA file. In Android, there is an APK file. And it will just publish it to a staging directory. I will just publish the artifact and I will just use App Center distributed as an Android. And if I do that, I'll sorry, let me show you some. If I have some of my apps. So some of the thing it should be somewhere around here. So this is something you get after you deploy it in your application. So if you go to e stores, you can have multiple groups. So if you can publish to products and you can publish to your test part in uh what we call uh, despite of the iOS. And you can even do ad hoc distribution in uh, iOS uh, if you are building the pipeline using ad hoc mode rather than the release. Um, so, yep, it just takes a time. It is almost done. Mm. Yep, uh, now it is, this step is done. Let's check our application. Uh, distribute app, and we have our build. This is the application we new release eight, and it was made just now. Yep, we got our application, and I think I added the same step twice or something, and I get this two builds. Um, yep, I think this is it. Uh, I, I think I'll give you resources to how to build an application using Xamarin and iOS, and I think I will provide other resources in the chat after a while. And thank you for listening to my presentation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Santis. Uh, guys, if there is any questions, uh, we still yeah. have a few minutes to, to interact. Oh, yeah. And uh, Santis, if you could maybe uh, share your contact details, your LinkedIn or other uh, details. Oh, in the chat box, that would be helpful for everyone, I think. Uh, yeah, I will send uh, it in the chat box uh, after a while. Okay. Uh, do I have access to chat? I don't think I have access to chat. Oh, really? Yep, I don't think nobody has access to chat because chat in chat meeting is only available to team members. Oh, okay. So this, this meeting was created in in a channel then, right? Yep, probably. Yep. And you need to have okay. be a member of that channel. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. So, yeah. So, are you able to view what's written in the chat? No, not not right. Uh, you no. can't right? No, no, no. Oh, okay. Okay, no, no problem, no problem. Uh, yeah, if you guys have any question, any? I can answer them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chris, please feel free to ask questions. Uh, nothing should stop in asking questions, by the way. <laughs> any silly question is also welcome. Yeah. It looks like there's no question, right? No queries. Yeah, probably. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, tell us a bit about how is it? How is the situation back in 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 Sydney? Ah, uh, it's getting worse. Actually, we are having like two hundred COVID cases. I haven't left my house in fifteen days. I think. Okay. Yeah. So it's increasing. Yeah. The cases yeah. are increasing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So stay safe and uh, thank you so much, Sandesh, uh, for your presentation. Uh, before we move into our uh, next session, I just wanted to uh, mention uh, saying thank you to our uh, supporters, to to Microsoft, to TechSathi, to Dogma Group. Um, uh, for the continued support, uh, we are partnering more with uh, other organizations in the in the near future because uh, we are we are going to to run a lot of uh, newer initiatives, uh, more than just just more than the the meetups. So uh, yeah, um, so with this, uh, let's move forward. Uh, we still actually have a few minutes left, but uh, um, Saad, if you are ready. Maybe we can start with yours. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me know if you guys can hear me properly. Yeah, can hear you. All right, wonderful. OK, so I'll be sharing my screen and uh, just let me know when you're able to see that. Mm -hmm. All right, is that visible? Yes, it is. OK, wonderful. I'll just stop the subtitle so that uh, it's easier. OK, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the meetup. And uh, like uh, really honored uh, by Nepal's uh, cloud group that I'm uh, able to join you guys as a speaker. So the session I'm going to talk about today is uh, one of the very critical service nowadays, which Microsoft is focusing a lot. That is uh, Azure Bastion. So we'll surely talk about it, and uh, I'll try to show you that. Okay, why do somebody would need this service in Azure, and uh, what is the role of the service? With that, like we'll try to see, okay, what is upcoming in the service and how you can start implementing it for your customers or your existing imp uh, environments. Before we get started, uh, it's good to know the person who's talking. So I'm uh, Saad Mahmood. I happen to be a senior data scientist. Previously, I used to be a cloud solution architect for apps, infra, then data and AI, and now I'm going to a new team, which is uh, in customer engineering, uh, and I'll be a data scientist there. Uh, previously, I used to be an MVP uh, for quite a few years, and uh, I really enjoyed that until I joined Microsoft, and then I had to give up that. Obviously, I miss uh, working with that community, uh, speaking, and uh, obviously writing books. Last time I wrote a book was this one, which is Cloud Native uh, Applications in .NET Core 2.0. Uh, I happen to be a MCT and a uh, number of certifications and uh, you can say uh, accreditations from uh, Microsoft and other different uh, companies as well. Very much hands on with uh, cross cloud solutions like uh, AWS you can talk about or GCP. So more than happy if you want to relate something with the cross cloud synergy or any kind related to that. 
All right, so uh, once again, thank you so much for inviting me. So first of all, uh, so I'll try to use a pen here so that we can just get started with that. So normally what happened is that, let me just try to show you the architecture first. Uh, there's a user somewhere in uh, XYZ country, let's say in USA or in UAE or any other country. So what happened is that these are the custom virtual machines customers. So these particular virtual machines that you were able to see, the person has to connect with that. Now, obviously, you know that if somebody needs to connect with those particular virtual machines, that has to go through internet, right? So if something goes through internet and uh, it is directly connecting to that particular virtual machine, obviously there has to be some open uh, ports that has to be opened there, which means that, for example, if there is a port 80, uh, port 443, that's totally fine. But for example, if there is port uh, 22 for SSH or maybe the RDP port is open, anybody can, anybody can try to go there and try to brute force that. So to remove that brute force attack, normally people come with different kinds of solutions. Like for example, one could be, hey, how about we limit that, okay, who should be able to connect with this particular virtual machine? So they go for something like side ranges, a set of IPs, uh, which are there and uh, they just define those site ranges into this particular uh, virtual network and uh, only those particular IP addresses are able to connect to the, these particular virtual machines. But there's a challenge. The challenge is, for example, what if somebody comes into your environment and he tries to brute force from your own machines or from your own IPs? That's still a bit of challenge. Now, how we can solve this? So you try to understand this particular problem that our customer face in uh, cloud actually, which is like uh, because cloud has almost, uh, if I talk about unlimited resources, uh, not really unlimited, but like we can think about unlimited in terms of like we can provision the number of resources we want to do. So that comes with unlimited power as well. And uh, the people who try to break the customer environment they always go with particular kind of solutions and scenarios where they're able to break this using uh, penetration testing, using uh, offensive security or different other kind of scenarios. So things like man in the middle attack, things like, uh, for example, bird force attack and these kind of things are very, very common. So now there is another solution which people come and OK, they say maybe we can try to add a new virtual machine. Here. And let's call this virtual machine as a jump box. So this particular virtual machine is a jump box. The reason you create this virtual machine is now you say, okay, hey, maybe you connect with this particular virtual machine. And from this virtual machine, you can always connect to these particular virtual machines because these are on the same virtual network, different subnets, but still you should be able to connect through these virtual machine. Now, the thing is that if you know lateral movement in Active Directory, what it does is that, for example, if you ever logged in from this particular machine to this particular machine, the particular, you can say, uh, the hashes and the particular password hashes and particular authentication keys and Kerberos tickets and ticket granting tickets like TGTs and all the respective stuff, they always are available in this particular machine, which means that anybody who would prefer this particular jump box should be having access like in case they mine the credentials and they do the lateral movement and they should be able to access this particular environment at one day or another. Now, how do we solve this issue? We add, you can say, a service we know that's known as Azure Bastion. So Azure Bastion, you can say in a very simple term, is uh, a managed jump box, which you don't have to provision, and it has certain features to it. Like for example, you can connect to uh, a public IP. So what it does is that uh, it creates uh, a kind of a browser environment. So you don't have to use your existing RDP or existing SSH command line tool to just uh, go and uh, log into your virtual machine. Either it be Linux or maybe that could be uh, Windows as well. So basically what you got to do is that you simply need to connect to your bastion. We'll try to see that in demo. And while we are connecting to your bastion, 
obviously uh, a browser window would pop up and that window would be used to just make sure that you're able to do all the respective operations you want to do over the RDP. So the second thing is that you're ex uh, expose your uh, like uh, uh, workload to public cloud, which means that you, if you're using Bastion, so we should be able to mitigate this particular issue, like we would not be exposing our workload to internet, which would not result in these kind of scenarios like man in the middle attack or lateral movement or having a jump box or these kind of things. So that would surely save us from that. As I told you, setting up a jump box is always a fine idea. Uh, I totally agree with that, but uh, how would you secure the jump box themselves? Like jump box here, if I just talk about this particular virtual machine, you would need things like uh, uh, credential guard or uh, device guard and these kind of uh, particular tools to just be sure, okay, this particular virtual machine is secure. And then what is the idea of having a jump box if it, even if you then have to secure this virtual machine and with this one, you have to secure other ones as well and you don't have a managed service and you're also paying for this jump box as well and that's a, that could be a huge cost depending depending on the traffic that you are having so once again uh the fourth thing is manage security on the jump box obviously that's something which i just talked about and last thing is uh, session recording and auditing now just give me an idea about like uh how would you ensure that okay, if X was a person, let's say Saad went to a particular virtual machine, and after moving to that particular virtual machine, he did X Y Z operations. And due to that X Y Z operations, what happened is that basically that virtual machine had a few issues, or maybe uh, there were some challenges with that particular virtual machine. So, how would you ensure that uh, this particular virtual machine that we are gonna talk about is something which is uh, uh, stable and if somebody does some operation on that you're able to view the the logs or maybe you need to audit that and do certain kind of stuff so normally in a in a legacy environment what customer do is that they go to this particular virtual machine they say okay hey let's pull logs and if you talk about logs logs are not always very friendly to read and uh, because they're not friendly to read, so how would you simply go in there and try to understand, hey, which person came, which, first of all, you have to go through multiple kind of logs, like for example, login logs and uh, the login details and logged accounts, these particular three kind of logs, first of all. Then you have to go to the operations logs where you have to understand, okay, what operations have been performed, which services has been started, what software has been installed in that, and then you have to make a correlation for that, and that can be a very messy situation. So imagine if there is a option that is able to record your session and able to audit the session, and in case you're doing anything which is something uh, like uh, a bit, you can say, moving from uh, a normal behavior, like for example, watching your uh, keys, or like for example, uh, for example, like uh, your internal keys or your secure password or something like that. If somebody's watching that over RDP, uh, I would like to show you a video in a demo. People would simply, uh, like uh, Bastion would simply disconnect those people who would like to try to like uh, uh, see the password and these, got these kind of sensitive information. And uh, there is a machine learning and the data science behind that that is enabling that, okay, whenever there is a session and in that session, somebody is trying to access something uh, secure or something uh, which is having a lot of security with that. So they are able to disconnect the session and send that alert to the particular user who's managing the, the, the virtual machine. So. Basically, uh, these are the challenges we normally face in a general environment and uh, like we need to fix these particular issues. Now the answer is we have Azure Bastion. So what does Azure Bastion does? So Azure Bastion like helps you connect to your remote workloads directly in the browser. Uh, by directly in the browser means that you don't have to install your RDP tool or you don't have to install your SSH tool or something like that. To just be sure, okay, you're able to connect to that particular virtual machine. 
What you got to do is simply you need to enable a Bastion service. And once you enable that Bastion service, you should be able to connect to that particular virtual machine over that virtual network. And at the end of the day, you should be able to connect using the browser. So Microsoft has built a kind of, you can say, uh, out of the box uh, application, which works within the browser and enables you with the RDP experience and the SSH ex experience. Uh, that's something we'll surely see when we try to create two virtual machines, let's say one Windows and then a Linux one, and then we'll try, okay, how we can experience that at your best in, uh, service in there. Second, th uh, second thing is basically uh, security handled by a Bastion service, which means that you don't have to worry about security. Hey, how my jump box is doing? Uh, do I need to secure that? Do I need to do X, Y, Z, blah, blah, blah? And obviously at the end of the day, when you have the jump box, you have to expose your RDP uh, ports here as well. So those particular open ports, you have to enable those ports here as well. Like for example, over the jump box as well. So, uh, just to uh, be sure, like uh, even if you create the the jump box, so at the end of the day, you are not 100% secure. Uh, the reason is that still your uh, RDP ports or maybe SSH ports are open, and you might be resulting in any kind of, as you can see, attack from uh, any of the intruder. So only need to export, uh, expose port 443, which means that that is the only port that you have to expose. You don't have to open any other ports, so this is a secure, uh, you can say HTTPS port, which means that normally uh, any of the HTTPS port open over, over the public internet uh, allows us with the uh, deterministic key of encryption, and uh, that encryption would sure there's a certificate authority behind that, and you would never be having any kind of challenge in terms of like uh, a data leakage, or maybe for example, things like which normally uh, in the banking sector, many of the customer do, they do things like uh, packet sniffing, which is a secure packet sniffing. Like if there is a packet which is moving over HTTPS traffic over 443, they try to sniff that. And uh, that's where TLS 1.2 and above comes into play. And they ensure that, okay, if some of the, or maybe one of the uh, HTTPS packet is sniffed, so they ensure that, okay, the communication is broken then. So there is no communication in case of sniffing or something. So uh, only a secure port is exposed. And the second thing is that uh, uh, the TLS is ensuring that in case of any kind of challenge or the broken link or something like that, uh, they're always able to, uh, you can say, help with uh, this particular situation and uh, you're always secure with your environment. Now, why would somebody need a your bastion? Uh, a quick answer to that is like uh, financial sector. Uh, all of those customers who are having sensitive environment or production grade workloads over uh, their Azure environment and uh, they are running, but at the end of the day, they, what they want to do is that they want to secure this particular environment and be sure that nobody is able to connect to those particular virtual machines without any permission or respective privileges and whatever the person is doing on that particular machine, they're able to record that, they're able to uh, like audit that. And for example, let's say there's a person and that person comes into that particular machine and does something which breaks the functionality and the per person says, okay, hey, I was not the person and I didn't do anything. So they always have the recording proofs and kind of you can say the right uh, uh, right alert or something that they can use to just be sure that okay they are able to uh, make their lives easier. All right, so that's uh, the diagram we which we already have discussed. And uh, now let's discuss about this one. So what happened is that there is a your best in service. Uh, there's a gateway manager. So what gateway manager does is that it manages all the gateways in terms of like the person. Like this is let's say I'm sorry for my. Uh, pathetic drawing, but I'll still try to explain using that. So let's say this is a person A trying to connect this one. This is person B trying to connect this one. So what would happen is that at the end of the day, your Bastion would go to a gateway manager, and this gateway manager would manage all these sessions over the browser. And this is a multi-tenant environment. And for each of the uh, the virtual network you create, you would need one Bastion tenant. So one for each. Uh, you can say virtual network. Virtual network. 
maybe now it looks like a V. I hope so. And then there's a storage provider, uh, a network resource provider, and a compute resource provider. Now, why would you need these particular three resources? So let's try to understand. Gateway manages the session. Fair enough. We we know this. Now, why would why would you need the storage resource provider? So, for example, if there's a recording happening of a session, that has to be stored somewhere, right? And that's where the the storage resource provider comes into play. And uh, then there's the networking resource provider, which means that obviously uh, your bastion would be over certain uh, subnet, and that subnet needs to connect with the, the virtual machine, obviously over the private IP with uh, your backbone networking, and that's where you would go and you would uh, try to use a particular network resourcing provider. And last but not the least, obviously there's a compute involved behind that, so there has to be a compute resource provider. So in a nutshell, there, there is a gateway, and uh, the gateway is being managed by the network resource provider. All of the particular videos are being stored, or the clips that are uh, recorded would be stored in the storage resource provider. And uh, last but not the least, there has to be compute involved in this particular service. So uh, compute resource provider is something which is very critical there. All right. So where you can create uh, a your bastion service today. So today you can create a your bastion through uh, marketplace through VM Blade, which means that, for example, if you go to a certain virtual machine and in that virtual machine, you simply need to enable bastion. Just go ahead and try to do that. And the third option is a your network creation. So if you create a virtual network, you still have the option to create a bastion service in there. And uh, like that should be very much fairly easy kind of thing for you to do. Now, uh, before we go into the session auditing, my idea would be, OK, let's try to create a few virtual machines and try to see okay, how a your bastion works for, let's say, for Windows, Windows virtual machine. And also we'll see how would that work for a Linux virtual machine. So. Uh, for the demo purpose, let me just try to share my screen uh, for the demo, and uh, I believe we should be good then. All right, so this is my Azure portal. So this is what, uh, when you go to Microsoft Azure, this is what it looks like. Uh, now, the first thing is that obviously we have to create a resource group in there. Uh, why would need to, we need to create so that we can segregate those resources that I'm creating now and later on I can delete that. So it's just like a basket in case you don't know about what a resource group is. A logical uh, collection of your resources, nothing more than that. I'm doing that on a Azure pass. So in case anybody who wants to practice this one doesn't have any kind of, you can say, uh, availability of Azure, just ping me and I'll be more than happy to give you a pass so you can try the labs on your own and try to practice whatever you want to do. So resource group, let's say, uh, let me just try to name it RG dash. Uh, And I'll use East US, that's the cheapest region for sure. Uh, name, I'll try to add the tag here, which is to delete and try to add a value as a true. So at the end of the day, in case I want to select, okay, all the resource groups who I, which I want to delete, so obviously I can select that from the tag and I can do a simple query for that. So now uh, the resource group has been created. Uh, we'll take a moment or so. OK, here we go. And now we'll try to prove in the, uh, you can say, the virtual machines within this one. The first thing we want to prove in is let's try to create a Windows Server 2019 data center so that we can try to understand, hey, how would that behave when it comes to uh, managing or doing a RDP session for Windows Server? So I'll simply click on Create. And uh, here I'll give it a name, which is uh, Windows. VM, and just to add a prefix for that, which is Bastion, so B dash Windows VM should be good enough. Now I'll select the availability zone. Maybe I don't need availability for this time, so I'll simply go for it. no infrastructure redundancy. Uh, would not need a spot instance. Uh, DS 
to D2S V3 is good enough. I'll give a username and password. Now remember, even if you go with Bastion, you would need the username and password. It, it is not like, OK, you simply connect to that and uh, how would I enter the username and all that. So in case you're going to a work group and you're going through maybe let's say Active Directory or going through, you can say uh, your admin credentials. So everything is something which is possible within there. So I'll add a username. I'll add a password. All right. And uh, then I'll see, OK, which port is open. So I'll simply open RDP for now, and then later on we can uh, even uh, try to see okay, how we can remove this one. Uh, the disk is premium SSD, which is LRS. Fair enough for that. Uh, and it's trying to create a new uh, virtual uh, network. So that is RG Doodle Resource Group, and that's a VNet that it's creating, and that's having a basic uh, networking interface, and uh, it should be all good for me. I'll simply create this one. So we'll wait for a moment or so, let's say one or two minutes, and uh, I believe this should be done. Oh, here we go. So the template has been passed and now we should be able to create the virtual machine. So, OK. So while it's been created, let's try to do some multitasking and use the parallelism over the time just to be sure like, OK, how we can try to create a new virtual machine here for Linux as well at the same time the Windows has been created. So we'll select the resource group, which is this one. Uh, the VM name could be, uh, let's say, Linux VM. Looks all good. No infrastructure redundancy. Uh, I'll use Ubuntu 20.04. Now I can either go with the SSH public key or either, either I can go with the, you can see the password for now, just to, for, just to make sure like everybody's able to understand that I'm going with the username and password. Otherwise, uh, SSH public key is a better option here. All right, here we go. So I'll I'm, I'll be opening like SSH uh, 22 here. I'll go to the disk, go to networking just to be sure. OK, my VNet is the same because uh, I need to be sure. OK, the same virtual network I'm having is for all the virtual machines uh, I'm going to have. So I'll go to management. I'll click on review and create just to validate that. Uh, ERM template. And once my ERM template is uh, done and it's validated, I should be able to create the virtual machine here. OK, ask me for my phone number. I hope it works. All right. So I'll simply create this one now and uh, would take the same time as Windows, I believe, or maybe some some less time because uh, Linux should be easier uh, for Windows. They have to install the operating system, so it might take a few more seconds, but Linux should be faster. That's what I believe. Let's see. So here I'll refresh that and I'm able to see OK. I'm able to see the B Windows virtual machine. So there's one virtual machine which is ready now. Just to be sure this works, uh, I'll try to connect that through the RDP. I'll download that public IP RDP. And uh, I'll simply click on this one. And I should be able to do the RDP here right away. By the way, our uh, Linux virtual machine is done. All right. All right, so here you should be able to see that I'm able to do the RDP now. Um, just to be sure. 
OK, it's taking a bit of time. I should be here. OK, here we go. So do we just check OK, this works, which is more than enough for us. I'll simply uh, disconnect that. And now I would like to show you something which is in this one. OK, let's try to see this one. So this is a Google hacking database, which is the exploit database. What happened is that, for example, uh, normally you have all the exploits here. So for RDPs and other, you also be able to find the exploits here in the database and you should be able to check. OK, like let's say you want to do some validation. You want to do some testing. OK, is my virtual machine secure? Is my environment secure? So you can use this. Uh, hacking database or exploit database just to be sure you're able to use this particular uh, you can say stuff and uh, it shows you OK how you can apply this one, what it would contain, uh, the date it uh, started and the, the exploit author who created the exploit and tried to tell you OK this is one of the way you can do some pen test or something like that. Like for example, just uh, an example for that would be I'll open a new tab. I'll paste this one and I should be able to see uh, a lot of web applications here and uh, like a lot of the information within uh, the particular environments should be able to see the username and password and the plain text and all that. So this is a very good website, I would say, uh, which is exploit DB. So you should be able to check all those particular exploits that you might be able to might be might want to like uh, see OK how we can test and try and do some pen testing for our virtual machines. By the way, let's do a simple thing now. I'll go to. The virtual machines and under virtual machines, I should be able to see OK now there is one for Linux, one for Windows. Uh, just to enable uh, Bastion, it's a very simple process. Uh, here you should be able to see Bastion under operations. I'll simply click on this one and uh, it would show me like uh, a very automated way to create that. So there's a three step process. Number one, I'm having a virtual network, so it says uh, do you have a virtual network address space? So I do have that address space with me. Uh, now within that address space, it would try to create a, a bastion subnet. So I would say OK, more than welcome go and create your subnet so it would create a subnet in this particular address space now because it is done so it shows me okay step two of three is done now and now the idea would be to create the bastion service now to understand this one bastion is today available in the basic and the standard uh, tier in standard the auditing is available in basic it's almost free you can use it with your virtual machines and try to explore it more but in case you're having some more of like a bigger environment where it is a production grade environment, it is recommended that you're able to use a standard version. Now, with respect to the environment, there are multiple people who would try to connect to this particular environment and uh, you might need to scale this service of like uh, connectivity and that's where you can increase the instance count of uh, uh, your bastion just to be sure okay in case you are able to face any kind of challenge in terms of like the uh, a lot of against the traffic routing to this particular virtual machine for remote sessions so you should be able to take care of this one now we would create a public IP because Bastion would need a public IP so that that public IP would be connecting to the private IPs of the virtual machine. So we would simply create Bastion using these particular default uh, assignments. And within a minute or so, it should be able to create Bastion service. Now while it is being created, I'll go back to the slides and would like to open up for questions. Meanwhile, this is being created. So maybe like this one. So that we know when it's done. All right, folks, so I'm open to questions. Meanwhile, in case you need to understand the service better, because obviously the demo has to come once the passion service is done, so uh, we'll we'll wait for that, but uh, Till that time, like I'm um, more than happy to answer any kind of question. I believe there's a hand raised. Hello. Uh, hi there. Hi, uh, Mr. Sir. 
uh, you can say the bastion is free in basic tier but when you creating the bastion there is an public ip uh-huh. uh, when we create using the bastion when you create the public ip so it mean we can pay it the bastion is paid services how uh, well uh, it depends like for certain subscription in a year which is an enterprise subscription the the number of public ips normally are free which is around like uh, 10 public ips if you're going for more than 10 public ips the cost is very minimalistic like uh, if you are going to create a jump box which would cost you around like 200 to 300 dollars let's say a minimum uh, this service is almost negligible to that cost okay uh in uh, when we're using the vm we can uh, use the three um, patterns first ssh second rdp and the third is bastion you have seen uh, uh-huh. when we're using the ssh we can share the key to our client or our partner in rdp we can share the ip and password how can uh-huh. we share the bastion so uh, the way you can share the bastion is in bastion service you would simply provide access to uh, the respective person as an invite the person would come to the portal and from the portal they can always once i would show you the demo you should be able to see that okay uh, the way the person should be able to connect to that particular environment so you would simply give the access as part of you can say role based access control inside ayer uh, to maybe a uh, guest user or maybe to anybody who you want to like give access to and uh, should be able to go into portal and try to access Bastion from there. No, uh, you are right, but I am giving to the uh, to my client. When uh-huh. I giving to the access to my client, I'm not recommended to give him the permission of my portal. Why you are not uh, recommended to give the permission to portal because you can give an RBAC access to uh, their respective resource and uh, the, the particular person you would not be able to do anything except like uh, just read only access to the virtual machine. Yeah, I believe it's even more secure than giving a username and password because if you just give that you might be giving some admin privileges. You might forget to change the rules on the, the machine. You might change like uh, be forgetting like, OK, how would I manage a local account? Then you have to manage two accounts, a local one and then a cloud one for the customer would be a big hack of situation. OK, thanks a lot. Uh, also, I need the uh, subscription of fast Azure for experiment. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, once I'll give you the details, more than happy to see if you are able to connect with me and uh, I'll be more than happy to share the pass with you so you can test and try that. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Any other questions? Guys, I'm open to any kind of question you guys are having, so don't be uh, hesitant in terms of like asking the question because if you don't ask the question, so maybe you might not be spending much time on your understanding. So feel free to ask a question and uh, no question is a bad question according to me, I would say. I'll still try to like focus and try to help you with whatever understanding you're having. So if in case you're having any questions, feel free. I believe there is a hand raised by Abhishek Shukla. Yeah, sure. Right. This is Abhishek. Uh, so as you mentioned that each and every VNet must have its own bastion. So can we also have uh, the bastion sharing between the VNets? Uh, that's a very, very good question, I would say, Abhishek, and thanks for asking that. So what would happen is that uh, between the two virtual networks, what we can do is we call VNet peering. OK, and uh, if we are doing the VNet peering, we should be able to share the bastion service. But you need to understand uh, that within the virtual network, the maximum limit of the bastion is up to 50 counts. Which means that in case you are using a hub and spoke architecture, and in that particular hub and spoke architecture, you are having, like you can say, more than 100 virtual machine resources, uh, this might be a bit of like troublesome situation. So that's why we recommend maybe it would be a better idea to uh, have a separate bastion service for the virtual networks. Would, it would make things easier. OK, yeah, thanks. Any other question, guys? I guess it would take some time to prove in, and then obviously then I can demo you. So we have to wait for a few minutes, but uh, questions are always welcome.
Uh, Saad, as we discussed, maybe you could speak a bit about uh, the product engineering team that you're working currently with. Yeah, so I'm working with like a customer engineering team and uh, uh, a few things that I would like to mention here is that uh, uh, there are a few tips and tricks, I would say, that whenever you are working with uh, a few services in Ayer, so always check, uh, you can say, Ayer blog, which is a very fine resource, I would say. And in that Ayer blog, you should be able to um, route yourself to maybe let's say announcements. And everything which is happening on cloud, you should be able to see that, like uh, what kind of announcement are made, is there any new data center coming into place, or maybe new service which is being uh, introduced, like for example, a hey, virtual desktop, what are, what are the enhancements which are being made and these kind of things. So it's always good to be uh, part of a kind of you can say community or part of that particular blog where you can inter interact with the people like for example uh, power of your business application and analytics so you can go in here you can try to uh, maybe many of those have the options to comment so you can comment in here try to understand so they have a lot of you can say good stuff in here second would be uh, at your Friday so a lot of our you can say program managers they go to Ayer Friday and uh, uh, that's the session with a Scott uh, with Scott Hanselman and uh, during that session you should be able to see the new videos new upgradations new topics new products which are coming or maybe new features which are coming so you should be able to see all those particular videos and uh, kind of latest content from right from the engineering team uh last but not least i would like to at the end of this uh session i would like to show you okay what the roadmap looks for this particular service like uh, uh you were talking about the shareable link that's something which is upcoming in here where you can share this link with anybody and uh, anybody should be able to try to connect with that and that's where uh access signatures would come into play uh, like, OK, what person who you are sharing the link with would have like what access or up till what kind of access the person would be having to that particular virtual machine that you are sharing the access to. Session recording and auditing, which is not currently available today, but I would like to show this video to you that how this particular thing works. This is the beta version of, uh, sorry, private preview of uh, this particular uh, functionality that we would like to demonstrate to you as well. So that is about it in a nutshell that how you can maybe stay updated or use this particular resources. I'll be more than happy to share these resources after the session uh, with the moderator just to be sure that uh, they reach you. And uh, in case of any questions, uh, I'm more than welcome. You guys can reach me out for that. Let's wait for a bit. Uh, Saad, uh, Saad uh, if you are OK, uh, mm -hmm. in Facebook we have a group called Nepal Cloud Professionals. Yep. There are nearly about 2000 members and uh, maybe you could just uh, add those resources into that. Just uh, uh, would be fine would later be, after, yeah. after the session. Yeah, I'll be more than happy. I can share this slide deck and I can also maybe share the resources, whatever I've got. So no worries about that. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Any question you guys want to ask related to Microsoft, related to cloud, related to anything, or maybe you are up to a certain journey and you want to get some help or something like that, I'm more than happy and welcome to take your questions. I believe there are no more questions. So, uh, uh, I think Basin is pretty new for the, the audience that we have. I think that could be mm -hmm. the reason. Uh, so this is already publicly. I mean, this is into the general availability, right? So, yeah, yeah. So uh, what happened was that uh, this service, we were not planning to launch it till the end of this year. But uh, now you're able to see the Bastion is not like kind of you can say preview or something. It is generally available to the, all the public. What happened during the pandemic was that we were having a lot of customers and a lot of hacking situations were happening with a lot of customers because everybody was working remotely and uh, uh, 
the situation try to like you can say in in a nutshell, I would say that was pathetic and uh, because of it, like we had to come up with a kind of solution which is securing uh, the stuff for our customers and making sure that their lives are easier. So uh, we came up with this service. So like, for example, now you're able to see the best in services created. Uh, no first would take some time, but surely this particular service would be created right away. Now I would use my credentials, which I was trying to use for the virtual machine. So. And let me just try to connect. So once I try to connect, so you're able to see that, that that's the, the public IP it created. And uh, here it's asked me, okay, do you want to allow like text images or copy or something, do this kind of stuff in here. So this is the experience that you would get, like uh, you would be able to do anything. And this is for one time login, which means the next time you want to log in, you have to open a new session. It's not like you would refresh this one and it would say, okay, boom, let's do it. No, this is not something that's it's the way it's going to work. So uh, let's say I'll go to the local server and try to turn off these enhanced settings. And uh, let me say I just want to open an Internet Explorer and uh, we'll try to go to a certain website. So while I'm here, just notice a, a particular thing, which would be let let me just go to the bastion service itself, which is this one. And if I just go to session, so if everything goes well, okay, this is a different bastion service. I'm sorry for this one. Let me just try try to go to the right bastion service, and uh, yeah, here we go. And the session, I should be able to see my session, which is currently going on. Oh, here we go. So it tells me the session ID, the start time, the target subscription ID, who is the person who's trying to access this one, which what username and all the respective stuff, what is the target IP address, and uh, what is the resource ID the person is trying to access. And later on, we are trying to uh, get, you can say a kind of, you can say uh, the video of that particular session, the recording for what person has done with within this particular session. So for each session ID, you would have a reflected uh, a cold storage video within, uh, you can say, your storage account that will be available in the future. So now as I disconnect the session, I should be able to see, OK, now I try to refresh it and. Uh, there you go, no results. Let's try to do the same thing with the Linux virtual machine. So I'll go to connect and uh, I'll go to Bastion. I say use Bastion. It asked me, okay, do you have a username? So I've got it and uh, I have got our very secret password. Is it really secret? Yeah, that's really secret. Okay, so it's connecting, and uh, if everything goes well, I should be able to see the bash command. Oh, here we go. So, sudo su. Here I am, and I'm logging out. Here we go. So, it's really simple to connect with either Windows virtual machine or a Linux virtual machine, or what I'm going to do right now is that I'll go to the, the virtual network, and uh, I can see, OK, what are the network interfaces? So there are three particular, you can say, connected uh, devices, which is uh, one bastion host and two network interfaces. What I can do now is that maybe I can go to my Linux virtual machine. I can go to networking and maybe I can uh, try to uh, edit this particular rule. And I would say, OK, don't add any, you can say, resource, but maybe a service tag. And I would like to have the traffic only from the virtual network, which means that no public traffic should be able to access this one. I'll I'll try to save it. And uh, by this particular uh, change of the rule, uh, nobody should be able to connect that through the public IP now.
only through the virtual network, which is my private virtual network, and nobody should be able to access that. Now let's try to connect that and see if my claim is right and wrong. So I'll go to Bastion, try to add my username. Let me just try to connect this one. All right, there are some challenges. Let me just try to connect it again. OK, which is fine, but let's try to check with the Windows as well. So if my claim is right, I should be able to check this one. Let me just try to connect this one. OK, we are good. So this is about, you can say, Bastion, but uh, like what's coming and uh, what are the other, you can say, details that I would like to share with you guys. Uh, let's try to see that. I'll turn on the subtitles, the most uh, difficult thing to handle. OK, so I'll run this video. So now what's happening is that this person is uh, trying to log in through the Bastion service. It connects through the Bastion service for sure. One of our members is preparing this video for us. So uh, it would go to Chrome and try to go to the portal. And in portal, what it would do is that he would uh, open some, you can say, secrets uh, within a certain service of Azure. And while it goes to the secret, the session would terminate automatically. So you're able to see it's logging to the portal. And uh, while logging, so the person would be going to a certain uh, service, which is a, a computer VM service, and would like to go and try to see this key. So it says that we have detected unauthorized behavior. And now you should be able to see that this is something, something which is coming in Bastion very soon, which is more like that uh, you should be able to see the recording of that particular incident. So it would just refresh and try to wait while this video has been generated. And uh, so refreshing again and see if that's visible. Oh, there we go. And we will download this one and try to run this. And here you should be able to see all that particular incident. The person went to the portal and after going to the portal, like the person went to a certain service and that's where the session got disconnected. Here we go. So that's something which is upcoming in uh, uh, this particular service. So what's in the roadmap? A Bastion shareable link, which is coming very soon in uh, Q1. The Q1 is already here. So you should be able to see that very soon. A peered virtual network support. So today the peered virtual network support is there, but that's weak. So uh, it would be, you can say, more uh, combinative and more available just to be sure that the automatic scaling uh, feature can really help that peered virtual network and only one bastion can work for a complete environment. That's something which would be coming. Uh, Multi-tenancy, many of the customers which we are having, they're having like multiple small companies within their one big umbrella company, and that's where the multi-tenancy would really help in terms of different, uh, you can say, Active Directory uh, tenants and uh, multiple subscriptions within Azure as well. And many more, so just stay up to date with that particular, you can say, Azure blog link, and that should really help you. So resources, uh, your Friday demo. So just have a look at this demo and you should be able to check that and see, OK, how you can use it and uh, like uh, other different kind of ideas, you would be able to get that, how you can implement this one as well. 
And last but not least, uh, I would like to thank you for listening to me and uh, spending all the time with me. Uh, so in case you want to connect, these are my, you can say, uh, contact details. You can search me over Facebook with my name. You can send me an email in case you want to send to, and I'll be able to share this particular slide deck uh, on, uh, you can say, the Facebook portal maybe, uh, in a group maybe. So yeah, and feel free to connect and uh, more than happy to take any kind of questions you're having. Could be related to Bastion, could be related to Microsoft, could be related to Azure, could be related to your own personal development. So if you have a few minutes remaining, so I'm more than happy to take any kind of questions. OK, looks like there's no further questions. So yeah, thanks a lot, Saad Mervat, for your, your session today. It was very, very enlightening, and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. So with this, if there's no question, shall we move into the next session? Yeah, I believe you're good. There are no more questions, and uh, yeah, so we are good to go. Thank you so much okay. uh, for listening, guys, and thank you, uh, Pradeep, for giving the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much, uh, Saad. So uh, yeah, let's move ahead. And uh, with this, uh, let's uh, have our next session around uh, the event-driven architecture using Azure Event Create. Uh, so this is going to be by, with uh, Avishek Sukla. So uh, I'm not going to introduce Avishek because I would really expect that you spend some time, about a minute or two at least, to to speak about yourself first and then uh, move into the session. So over to you, Avise. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. And those who are not from our time zone, please accept my greeting as per the times in their respective time zones. So let me share my screen. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. OK. OK, so yeah, welcome everyone. My name is Abhishek Shukla and I'm senior technical architect in HCL Technologies India and uh, having around uh, 18 plus years of experience. And we used to develop, uh, means I used to develop solutions related to Microsoft Azure, uh, means designing and developing solutions with leveraging uh, the capabilities offered by Microsoft uh, Azure for various uh, of our customers. So if anyone would like to reach me, he can reach me on my uh, Gmail ID. And if you would like to connect me, you can also connect me onto the LinkedIn. So before starting the today's session that is related to event driven architecture by using event grid, uh, let's have some discussion on what is an event. So anyone who would like to uh, answer this, who can answer this, or I will explain that what uh, we mean by an event. So event is like something which has happened, a phenomena which occurred for a very small amount of time. That's called an event. Uh, you just switch on uh, the lights. It's an means clicking to that switch is an event. For an example, you are you are uh, living in a room and suddenly there got a fire and there is a smoke. So immediately as soon as the detectors detects the smoke, and they, they raise the fire, fire alarm. It's an event. So event is something happened. Event, it will give you some sort of notification. It will trigger a reaction. You clicked on the switch and either the light will put on or the light will put off. So it triggers a reaction. Events is always based on the facts. So like uh, because you have clicked onto the switch, that's why either the power has been put on or put off. 
there was a uh, there was a smoke or there was a fire that's why the sensors rings and even can be discrete or it can be based on certain series so type of events can be divided into the discrete events and the series event so discrete events are generally the independent event you put it on the switch that's on and as soon as you click onto the switch the state has been changed the state of the object has been changed and it's actionable because the light were on or the light were off so it's an actionable when we talks about series of events so it means they are the time based event and they have certain context on by using those context you can partition them time based events used to uh, report their conditions and they are analyzable so if you say something is going to fail for an example you are using uh, a web server and suddenly the load get starts increasing and after a certain time you find that your web application or web server is not able to response for the events or response for the uh, new request it means it's analyzable once you will get all the logs the data from that events or data from that series that what happens you can analyze that what happened why your server become unusable why it is not responding to the request when we talks about the application developments we used a uh, few uh, uh, patterns to create uh, the applications the very common is the message based pattern so you says okay your producer consumer or multiple uh, services in your application will get interact to each other on the basis of some messages same is happens on to the uh, events also the only difference between the messages and the event is like uh, the communication how the communication will happens if you are developing uh, a message based solution it means you are expecting that whosoever is receiving your message will respond right if i am if i am asking you whether my screen is visible or not i am assuming that okay someone will respond to it but if i will talk about the same thing on to the event driven or i will talk about on to the event notification i will simply not bothered about that what happened to my receivers i have shared my screen no matter you have you are able to share, see it or not right so even if if we will try to distinguish between the event driven versus the event sourcing so event driven says it's event notification like broadcast state changes then no exception uh, no expectations from the customer or no expectations from the consumers it's it you can say it's like a like a fire and forget kind of scenario just send your event information and forget about it what happened it is basically used for decoupled logic right so you you can say that your applications are completely decoupled your producer and consumer both are completely decoupled producer send the events no matter consumer is analyzing or uh, consuming that event or not or what happened to your event when it comes to the event sourcing so event sourcing says that it will persist the state change it means if you will replay the events into the reverse order or the order in which they occur you will get uh, the initial state of your object and event sourcing is auditable as well as event sourcing also offers you the replay capabilities so why we should prefer event driven architecture instead of messaging architecture right so let me uh, uh, open a okay so when we said that we are using uh, event driven or the messaging so let first what will happen if we will use the messaging architecture 
in the messaging architecture definitely you will have a broker in between and that may be your uh, storage uh, queue or it may be your azure service bus queue or if you don't want to go for any specific uh, azure services you can leverage any other uh, uh, options available so in this case what will happen whenever the consumer will send the events your event uh, whenever the consumer will send the messages right they all get stored here into the broker. And your consumer will have to do a poll operation so that time to time it will go and check that whether there is a message or not, whether there is a message or not, right? So this is message based pattern. If you are not using any brokered message, any broker between the producer and the consumer, your producer and consumer can directly have all this. OK, so you can send the message and you will accept that uh, uh, that there will be a response from the consumer side so that you should uh, able to know that what happens. It's a kind of acknowledgement mechanism. All these uh, both of these uh, like architecture have their own pros and cons because here you are saying that OK, these two are directly connected to each other. So producer must be uh, producer must uh, uh, know that what is the location of your consumer, where it is going to send the events. If this is a direct, uh, where it is going to send the events or the messages, if there is a direct communication. By having the broker in between, you are uh, achieving a decoupled, a decoupled in your architecture that now producer not need to bother about it that who is going to consume the messages. Maybe down the line or after some time you can change this consumer. You can have another consumer here, right? Who will respond or who will process all these uh, messages which are there into the message broker or you can say which are there into your storage uh, queues or service bus queues. What happened into a event driven architecture? In an event driven architecture, your producer will simply send an event to your consumer, but not directly to the consumer. He will simply send the events to a event broker in between. Right, so all the events will go to this event broker and your event broker will have. The consumers or you can say the listeners registered to this broker. OK, and instead of having the. Polling between the consumer and the uh, broker, it will simply a push push mechanism. Your producer is pushing the events to your event broker and event broker is further pushing it to the listeners or to the event handlers or you can say the consumers okay so event driven architecture consists of event producers that generates a stream of events and events consumers those listens for those events and event driven uh, events are uh, uh, delivered in a nearly real time, right? No polling mechanism is required. What happens in the polling mechanism? You need to define that after if there is uh, no message there, then after uh, how long uh, uh, time next polling action will be happen. So you can say sometimes it may be the linear, it may be the exponential. So if it is linear, you can say two, four, six, eight. If it is an exponential, you can say two, four, sixteen, and then further. Event driven architectures uh, is uh, uh, used to implement whenever you are you would like to process the single event processing or you would like to process the complex event, sometimes event streaming processing also. But when we say event streaming processing, it means we have other services available in Microsoft Azure, which you can leverage, especially the event hub. And if you are looking uh, for uh, the open source, then you can have uh, the we have Kafka available 
And if you would like to port your open source Kafka implementation, suppose you are already using that Kafka and you would like to port it into Microsoft Azure. Yes, you can port it to Microsoft Azure by using the respective SKU of your Azure Event Hub, where you can enable the Kafka streaming. So you can use those things to process the events. OK, so as I said, in event driven architecture, event producers need to ingest the event to your event broker. And event broker will further push those events to event consumers. Is it not necessary always that each and every event will be sent to every consumer? until and unless you have specified in that way. So you can have the filtering also. So you can define all those things. Now, if I would like to uh, create a event driven architecture on Microsoft Azure, then what kind of feature Microsoft uh, Azure offers us? So as I said, if it is a large uh, streaming data you need to process, you can go with the Azure Event Hub. If there is a uh, large streaming of data that is coming from uh, the device sensors or, or it's a kind of uh, IoT related applications, you can go with the IoT Hub as well as we have another service in Azure that's called Azure Event Grid. You can also leverage this service to build event driven architectures on Microsoft Azure. OK, so. It's uh, uh, has outbound connectivity with various Azure services as well as it also offers custom connectivity. So your custom applications can also connect to event grid for sending the events or from receiving the events. OK, so if I will talk about that, what are the various services which which a event grid can support? But prior to that. Uh, but prior to that, what kind of capabilities we have? So event grid is very simple to use. It has advanced filtering. You can filter it. Uh, you can filter out uh, the events before sending uh, to the listeners. It supports fan out. So when we said fan out means uh, there will be one input and it can go for the multiple output. It's a called it's called uh, the fan. Uh, in or fan out architecture, so you can say that OK, this is like fan in and from here it's going to for multiple or single. It's called fan out. Then it's reliability. Azure event grids are reliable. It has 24 hours retry with exponential back off so that it will make sure that events will be delivered. Now when it comes to the cost, you will have to pay for pay per event. It's not like that. You just created uh, a event grid and you have to start paying. No, until and unless you have no consumer defined into it, no listener uh, defined into it and you are not sending any event to it or distributing event through it. You will not be charged. It has a very high higher thro uh, throughput and. It is uh, have supports for the built in event as well as I said, you can use custom uh, applications to leverage event grid in your app uh, in your solution. So in uh, a hands on demo, I will let you know that how we can leverage uh, uh, the C sharp to get interact with event uh, grid. Before moving forward, anyone have any questions? OK, so let's move forward. As I said that event grid has built in support for various Azure services. So on to the left hand side of this uh, image, you can see that event grid can be uh, can be linked with blob storage with media services as your subscriptions, resource groups, event hub, IoT hub, service bus and the custom topics. When we said custom topics, it means you can write your own code to get interact uh, or to get uh, integrated your application with event grid. On to the right hand side, you can see that 
the types of event handlers which a event grid supports. So you can use Azure function. You can write Azure functions. And within the Azure functions, you can uh, write the logic that how you would like to um, process these events. And you have to write the code by yourself. Then we also have the logic app. So logic app, we know that it's a workflow driven uh, service. It's a serverless service where you can create uh, the visual workflow. You can use as your automations. As well as you can create web hooks also, no matter whether these web hooks are created within the Microsoft Azure subscription or it's somewhere else. If you have a generic web hook which can accept any incoming data, then yes, you can use it. So for an example, if you would like to use a HTTP bin kind of service, then you can use it. But before using, make sure that sometimes uh, because it's a public service, and if you are creating an endpoint and you are publishing it, then your data will be there and anyone who know uh, the address of that public web home, he can also see that data. Then queue storage can also be used as a listener for your uh, event grid. Whatsoever event will be uh, delivered to this queue storage, it will be stored there as a packet, the message packets. You can create hybrid connections, so you can use your on-premise applications or applications running in some other cloud, but they can listen the events for your event grid. As well as you can also create event hubs, so you can you can integrate event hub with as your event grid. If large number of events are getting a uh, uh, processed by event grid, then definitely event hub will be the good options because it has auto scale up properties. And you not need to worry about uh, the scaling your uh, handlers or handlers as per the demand increases. OK, so when we used to work with event, so every event must have some information available. So that it will be uh, it will be able to understand by your listeners or by the event grid itself. So event grid says it must have the event. So what happened? Event sources where the event took place, whether it's an storage, it's an Azure functions, it's an resource group or any custom application. There must be event subscriptions. So there must be listener attached. So that they will process your events. Then the event handlers. Event handlers, actually the listeners and these event handlers you have to attach by creating the subscriptions onto the event grid. So we will see that. How it works, so you see that there are multiple sources and these sources are generating the events. These sources may be out of box connector and they may be the custom and onto the right hand side you have subscriptions created and these subscriptions are created for the handlers. OK, and these handlers are responsible to consume or process your event. So let me uh, demonstrate how we can create uh, the Azure event grid onto the portal. So let me know once you guys are uh, able to view uh, my screen. Bring it from. Yeah, we can. Yeah, actually, I'm using this two monitor setup, and sometimes it causes problem. Okay, so you have to go to the portal.azure.com. And you need to select the event grid topic, or you can search it from here. So you have to go to the event grid topics. And I yesterday uh, when uh, Pramod approaches me, then I created one, but just let me create the another one. So create a resource group. Let's RG demo. 
you have to give a name. It should be meaningful name. So demo. Event grid. I hope it will be available and the reason where you would like to create it. So East US. Here you can see onto the advanced tab that you have to define that what kind of schema you are you are assuming that your event grid will honor. So currently we have event grid schema and we have CCNF specified cloud event schema version 1.0 or we can have our own uh, custom input schema also. So CCNF is a governance body which has their own uh, schema and uh, event grid schema is based on that. So for this demonstration purpose, we will uh, restrict ourselves for this event grid schema. And these two are not required because they have uh, some uh, other use cases. It's related to identity. So this is not required for that demo and let me provision it. So once the review will be done. The provisioning for uh, your event grid will get a start. Till the time it's getting provisioned. So anyone have any any question uh, you can ask. Department got failed. Uh, the name of this is already exist. Sounds good. OK, so I need to go back. And this time, RG demo and event grid 31st July. OK, so meantime, we also need uh, to create uh, a listener for it. So I have already created a few listeners. I will let you know that uh, for the demonstration purpose, how you can create a listener in uh, in a short period of time. OK, so this has been created. And if you will go to here, you can see that to connect your event grid, you have to use these access keys. So either the primary or the secondary access key which you would like to use, you can use it. And this is the endpoint where your event sources need to publish the event, right? So these two way is always required whenever you would like to use event grid into your solution. If you are doing the same within the subscription itself, Maybe you can select it from the drop down, but from the custom you definitely need it. And here you see this is the event subscription. So event subscription says that you have to subscribe. You have to add some uh, listeners or you have to add some consumers. Either you can use this particular uh, uh, visual interface or you can go for the advanced editor and you can put the JSON there. So let me uh, give a name so we will say sub one and it's related to the filtering so we will come later on to it and here it's the endpoint detail endpoint details means the subscriber the listeners of your event grid or the listeners attached to your event grid who will process the event and here it's the filtering logic that only respective uh, events for which these listeners uh, are registered will send to them. If you will go here, you can see that this particular uh, event grid or a event grid supports as your function, webhook, storage queues, event hub, hybrid connections, and all these uh, services as a listener. If you are using Azure functions within your own subscriptions or connected subscriptions, you can easily go and select it. 
right? So you have to select your subscriptions. If your if your Active Directory is associated with multiple subscriptions, then you can select the subscriptions from the drop down, and you can drill down, select it, and it's done. If you have a generic web hook, yes, you can change it. You can select a web hook. Now, a web hook can either be within from within your, your subscription. It may be outside of your Azure subscription. It may be any public endpoint. So let's create a, a, a listener for it. And to create a listener, we will go and create a Azure web app and we will create uh, uh, a Docker containerized application. So you have to create a app service. And use this demo. Uh, event listener 31st July. Let's have a Docker container. Premium P2 Docker, and I will use uh, a Microsoft uh, supplied application from Docker Hub registry. And let have review plus create. So the meantime, this listener is getting created. Let me demonstrate how it looks like. And OK, let it be created. So Webhook is there. Now, uh, meantime, it's getting created. Let's jump back to uh, the presentation. OK, so as I said, event, every event must have some schema. And a schema is, uh, this particular schema is used to follow. No matter whether you are supplying a out of the box connected event or you are supplying a custom created event, you have to follow the schema. So. Each event must have a topic. Topic means the endpoint where you are going to send that event. It must have a subject related to a string. Must have a ID. It may be a GUID to identify the event. Event time is must. Event uh, event type is must. Event time at which time this uh, event has been occurred. And data is your actual data. It may be anything like smoke detected in room one, room two, or any specific location. If you will talk about uh, the real life application, say you are uh, doing some sort of online purchasing. As soon as you purchased a product and your order is get confirmed. So this particular information will act like a data that customer X has purchased the product one and this event has now been broadcasted. If multiple listeners are there, then you can say a warehouse listener, which will decrease the count of the product offering by one because one item, uh, because one instance of that item is already being sold. Then, because item has already been sold, then another listener, say, say shipment, they will process this data that they need to first package your item and they need to call the logistics service that OK shipment need to be uh, shipped to this particular uh, location. Then once it is done, another listener will process the same event to send the email notification or the SMS notifications to the respective buyer that yes, your product has been purchased. This particular uh, scenario which I given to you, it can be delivered either by using message based scenario or it can be used delivered by event uh, driven application. So according to your choice, whichever way you would like, but the preferred is still the event driven architecture. So 
if you will see a real life event a demo so this particular event is generated by a blob storage a blob storage event is like blob created or blob deleted so it has all the information where the blob event has been uh, generated you can see this the url means uh, the storage account as well as the container the type of blob like it was a block blob type or it was a uh, it was a uh, uh, append blob kind of type who was the client who requested this who 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 created this blob so all this information will be there and the listeners has to process this data part as i said every event has all these properties now come back to the portal and let's see if this has been uh, created or not so okay so let me see if this has been yeah so we can see that this has been created the web portal is also get created and let me browse this portal so this is the end point of your portal and we will use this portal for uh, viewing uh, the events which we are sending to our event grid so let me copy this so this is a generic event viewer same you can uh, but right now it's not associated it's not connected to your event grid it's it's a generic web application how you can uh, connect it uh, to your event uh, grid you have to subscribe and you have to add this event grid as a subscription so to add it we have to modify certain with this so this will be the address which i need to use that's okay and go back to web hook and let me use this so as soon as i will add this a very first event will start uh, displaying there so confirm selection and let me create so you see the very first event it's near real time uh, uh, mechanism to deliver your event and what is this event this is a very specific type of event it this particular specific event calls subscription validation event so it is not necessary that always you will connect a web hook and you will start receiving the events no you have to first validate you have to provide that yes you are the actual owner of this application okay you are the actual owner of this uh, web uh, hook how you can do this so whenever this particular event comes the very first event it comes with two things this is the validation code as well as the ur uh, this validation url if you are using any third party service as a event grid listener we are do you do not have the control on to the source code you can use this url and put a get request either by using any application or by just using browser once you will do this only after having this mechanism your event grid will accept this web hook as a listener this particular event url and the response code will only valid for 5 minutes right but if you are writing your web hook by using uh, some code you have the direct control then you can filter it out this event and you can programmatically do a, a, a eco operation so that you not need to do this operation manually so i will let you know how we can do this so here i am on to this uh, my visual studio and i have created this self registration uh, http trigger as your function and in this http trigger as your functions you can see at here so this is something like i was uh, doing to to figure it out whether it's a single event or a batch of events etc but you have to more focused on to this once you have received the events right once you have received the events then you have to figure it out whether it's a subscription validation event or not and if this is a subscription validation event then programmatically you can do the eco operation 
now now you can see because i am doing this programmatically i not need to put any get operation okay and this is the event which comes you during the creation or during the updation of your event list now right later on is uh, created for some different purposes so i will let you know why i have created i have already deployed this into the azure subscription so that we can uh, use uh, this azure function as a event uh, I, i will say as an event uh, listeners right here you can see that once i got the event data here i am doing some processing instead of doing any processing i am inserting the entire event data into my azure storage table okay reason behind is because i would like i don't want i would like to avoid uh, the using any http bin service and i would like to demonstrate how you need to process the data so you can see that you can type cast the incoming json in you can type cast into the object and then you can do the processing so for an example customer has already purchased the data you have the customer id you have the product id you have the product name now if you would like to send uh, the greeting email uh, to the customer you can easily send it uh, guys just give me one moment uh, the battery is getting discharged just give me one moment uh okay so you have to process that event so i am processing the event data just to ingest the entire event uh, into uh, my storage account okay so i have already deployed this uh, application as well as i also have another applications to send the event right how you can send program how you can programmatically send the events so i created this small interface to demonstrate it and it's by using few line of code i am able to send my data to my event grid so i need to provide the event grid topic url uh, i need to provide the access key as well as the subject and the event type and the data for this demonstration we will use uh, the uh, simple string based data and these are just the few line of code which i have written to send or you can say the submit my events to the event grid okay as i said that it's already been deployed so where it is has been deployed so this is your event grid and this has been let me go to what is your.com and you see this function app so as i created a http triggered function app i have deployed it here and i can go to go and see the functions and this is the url of the function so copy this url now what i am doing into this function so you can see it here that this function is an parameterized function i am providing a parameter here within these curly brackets right and to have this what i am going to do this i uh, i would like to create a azure storage table as soon as i will use this azure function as a registration as a event uh, listener or subscription why i created a parameterized way so that i can use single functions to to ingest uh, multiple type of events here so let me uh, uh, give this a name like uh, all demo so here this will be the url and let me try to register this url so once this uh, url will get registered it will create a azure storage table name as nepal so registration we have to go here create an event registration and you can see that i don't have any any table named nepal here okay let me go to the storage account 
and this particular storage account is used to deploy this as your function. Right now I don't have any table here. So go back to and select a webhook. I will use this uh, as your function endpoint. It's Nepal demo. Confirm selection, create. So as soon as I will register it, Event Grid will send a subscription validation event to this endpoint. And once that event will go there, it will successfully create an echo, right? So, so it's not created now. Uh, sometimes it takes time. So let see, it will it will get created. Now let me demonstrate that how you can uh, send uh, the events programmatically to this event grid. OK, so currently we have. This. This has been registered here. OK. Let me execute this submitter. OK. Event grid July 13. Go to the resource. Right. So here is the endpoint. OK, so we can say the subject line is uh, demo. This is demo event. And the type is. OK, so one event has been submitted and if I will go to this event viewer, we can see that event demo has been here and if I will submit multiple events. It's near real time. I am submitting the events from here. The event grid is somewhere in East US. Listeners is also in East US, so it's getting created there. And now let me go to uh, see whether this Nepal table has been created or not. OK, so this table has already been created the Nepal demo. And if I will open it here. I can see that all the five events which I have submitted the all these events are here. So by processing all these event data, I have captured the entire things here and now as per your requirement as per. Uh, uh, your. Your. Uh, uh, functionality you can process these event data and you can use it further. Meanwhile, any questions so far? OK. So. If we will uh, see it here, so how a event a normal events looks like if it is not a event uh, uh, subscription validation event. So you can see that whatsoever information we are submitting from here. That's all getting here. Now. You see that demo events has been. Uh, uh, listened by this event viewer as well as my uh, Azure function also. Let me filter it on based on this event type how I can do that. So I will clear all the events from here. And if I will go to the overview and the respective event subscription for which I would like to modify the filter for this. And OK, so I have to go to the filter section. And 
here I need to enable it for add event type because we would like to filter uh, the event on the based on the event type. So demo event. And I will save it. OK, and let me. Remove all such. OK, so this has been done. It's already been saved. Deploying in subscription Nepal. Now instead of sending this demo event, I will send the event like demo event one. Because I have created a filter, then this particular event will not delivered to my Azure webhook. But it will be delivered here. So it's there second, third, but it will not be there into my Azure table storage. Because of this filtering, if I will send the event like demo event, then it should be there into my table storage as well as. Into this. Uh, viewer also so let me here so you see the two events which a events uh, listener was entitled it's there if I, I would like to create another event and i would like to uh, have it for some uh, different uh, uh, requirement or filtration i can use the same azure function endpoint which i have created i can use that same azure function endpoint by just changing the name and I can register it for you say demo event too. So let it be created here. Event subscription. Demo event two. And this is the event grid topic. So event type. Event two. Wow. And let me create this is for demo event two. Right, so two event has been published. And it will take uh, some time. This uh, table need to be created and the events need to be populated here because it's it's an Azure table storage. So that's OK. It, take, it takes time. The first operation because uh, because of this. Uh, cold start of the Azure function. Here you can see. For any event subscription, you can use custom filtering also. So either you can filter on the basis of the event type as well as you can filter on based on the subject. So you can uh, filter the events listening based on the subjects also. So for an example, like uh, if subjects begin with or subjects end with. So let me jump to the presentation. So as I said, you first have to provide uh, the valid webhook and you have to prove that you are the owner of that webhook. So if you are uh, doing it from the code, you can do a synchronous handshake. If you are not doing it uh, with the code, you can go with a asynchronous handshake and you can use the validation code and validation URL property. So filtering filtering can be based on the subject and filtering can be based on to uh, your event type. So you can 
plus you can have custom filtering also but you have to make sure you should minimize the filtering because filterings uh, will affect the costing of your azure event track this is a use case on which currently uh, i am working like so this particular use case is a combination of event grid with azure functions as well as the azure cognitive services plus few more azure services so here in this case whenever someone will upload a file to the blob and blobs has uh, out of the box connectivity right so a event will get generated and we have created respective event handler for the respective cognitive services so one document will be processed by multiple cognitive services and because in the event into a cloud storage event or a blob storage event we have uh, uh, the blob uh, path also so as your functions will pass on this information to the cognitive services and cognitive will process that document or the image either for uh, the transcriptions either for the image uh, either for documentation or some specific purposes also and will update some other uh, services based on the response coming from the cognitive services so this is something called event domains it is basically used you can say that instead of using you would like to have the multiple uh, event grids they are living into the various uh, multiple azure active directory so yes it's called the event domains and one event grid can submit the information to the other event grids also so by this i would like to conclude uh, it so anyone have any question they can ask me hello does anyone have any question looks like no questions very pretty silent um i see aditya you have joined the call any questions aditya or prateek raman how are you finding it raman Yeah, it was a good session. But yeah, no question at all, mm, brother. Okay. Okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks everyone for joining this. Yeah. Are we done, Avishek? Yeah, I have done. If if you guys have any any real time scenario where you would like to ask that how Event Green can help us or any 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 messaging kind, yeah, I am okay for it. if anyone who is willing to use as your event grid into their uh, solutions or pocs they can ask all right uh, obviously it would be uh, great if you uh, are able to join uh, nepal cloud professionals uh, group it's a facebook group uh, if you are in facebook uh, and you could join that uh, it is just facebook.com/groups Okay. Yeah, definitely I will join. Okay, so let me off the sharing now. Mhm. Mm okay, yeah. so is my so, screen yeah, visible? Yeah. Is my screen still visible? No, it is not. It yeah. is not. Okay. Yeah, Pradeep, you can. Okay, seems seems like I'm getting some feedback. Um, anyways, just as, give me a second. Second. All right. So with this, um, so uh, we had one more session planned, but uh, due to some technical reasons, we are unable to continue on that. So in, with this note, uh, I would like to, uh, before I conclude, I would like to thank our supporters once again. Uh, our supporters, uh, Tech Sathi, Microsoft, Dogma Group, uh, for making sure that the session is smooth and uh, everyone everything is planned as 
needed in time. And I would also like to thank all our speakers today uh, for your, for contributing in your time to speak. Uh, Sandeh Skarki, Saad Mahmud, Avishek Sukla, and uh, and uh, Yuvraj Dahal. So so uh, Yuvraj would be uh, continuing on to our next meetup, as he says, uh, uh, because of some technical issues. Uh, so with this, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, joining today. I'm sure that. Uh, uh, you know, somehow you were able to gain uh, some understanding around these topics around uh, Azure, uh, various Azure services, primarily around Azure services, and hope to meet again uh, very soon, probably the next month itself. But uh, depending on the, uh, we need to figure out the, the topics, area of interest. And uh, uh, yeah, so uh, if you have any specific concerns or topics that you would want us to cover in our upcoming meetups, Please uh, reach me. You can uh, uh, or directly write at Nepal Cloud Professionals uh, groups as well. So, uh, yeah, uh, if there is no further questions, so I would like to formally close this session today. Uh, I'll be here for the another one minute. If uh, if if there's anything that you would like to uh, uh, mention or speak about, but yeah. Uh, Let's uh, formally close this session today. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining it. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Prajudai, for organizing this session. Thank you.